first of all, good afternoon to everybody joining us from Bangladesh and other parts of South Asia, and good morning to anybody joining us from the UK. I'm Richard Hawkes, I'm the Chief Executive of the British Asian Trust, and I'm absolutely delighted to be welcoming you to another one of the exciting programme of exclusive webinars that, that we have been organising. Today, I'm especially pleased that we're going to be focusing on Bangladesh, uh, and it's excellent that we've been joined by such a, an esteemed panel um, that uh, you'll be introduced to in a second, but in, in summary, we have Robert Chatterton Dixon, who's the British High Commissioner to Bangladesh, Saida Muna Tasneem, who's the Bangladesh High Commissioner to the UK, Farooq Saban, who's a former very senior Bangladesh diplomat and a member of the British Asian Trust Bangladesh Advisory Council. And I hope that we're going to be joined by Ms. Fiza Kabir, who's the chief exec of the Sajida Foundation, which is one of our partner organizations in Bangladesh. I, I'm genuinely delighted that we're having a session that is focused just on, on Bangladesh. It had always been a real ambition for the British Asian Trust to start working in Bangladesh. And in recent years, we've been able to make that a, a reality. About a year ago, we had a tremendous launch event in Dhaka and Robert was our guest of honour and there were senior government ministers from the Bangladesh government. And we were also very pleased to receive a special message from His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. Had it not been for the COVID, COVID pandemic, we would have made great progress this year. Unfortunately, that has not been possible, but we have been able to support three organisations in their emergency response work to COVID. One of those being Sajida Foundation, which, as I said, I'm hoping that Fizza, the chief exec, is able to join us in a, in a minute. We do have really ambitious plans for Bangladesh, and we're very fortunate to have an excellent group making up our Bangladesh Advisory Council, chaired by my very good friend, Shayan F. Rahman, who I'm sure many of you will know, and including Farooq Saban, who has very kindly joined our panel today. I also have to say that we're very fortunate to have a great relationship with Saida Muna Tasneem, the Bangladesh High Commissioner to the UK, who will really help us raise awareness of our work with the Bangladeshi community here in the UK. And I'm delighted that she's also on our panel. For those of you who, who, who don't know, the British Asian Trust is, is such an incredible organisation driven by the British Asian diaspora and His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. And we're supported by some of the most incredible people across South Asia to make the most positive difference possible for poor and marginalised people in the, in, in the region, uh, with programmes across Bangladesh, India, Pakistan and Sri Lanka. In 10 years, we've changed the lives of more than 4 million people. And we know we're needed now and in the months ahead more than ever. We're extremely fortunate to have an amazing group of trustees, advisors, Founder Circle members and ambassadors. One of those ambassadors is a long-standing supporter, Connie Huck. Connie is a TV and radio presenter, screenwriter and a children's author, originally finding fame as the longest serving female presenter of the UK's most popular children's television programme, Blue Peter. She's been a presenter and guest of many other shows. And in 2019, her children's book, Cookie and the Most Annoying Boy in the World was published. We're absolutely delighted to have Connie join us today to host this session. And before I hand over to her, let me just point out a couple of things. We've, we've had some great questions come in already ahead of the session, which Connie will be asking. And also, if you want to ask any questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A box. I think we, we all know how that works now. So please type them in and we'll make sure that we, we get those to Connie. We'll also be recording the session today and then sending that out to all of you and people who've not been able to join us and putting it on our, our socials later as well. So I hope all of that's okay. And without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome Connie Huck, who's going to now take over uh, convening the rest of the session. Connie, over to you. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, it's great to be here this morning, um, joined by so many. And please do send your questions in throughout and we'll try and get through as many of them as possible. Um, as Richard mentioned, we are going to be talking about the relationship between Britain and Bangladesh following the COVID-19 pandemic. And hopefully this will be a very insightful session 
Um, we're going to be summarising the situation in Bangladesh. How are things looking there at the moment? And how has Bangladesh overall managed this epidemic, which has blighted so many countries? Also, we want to look at what will happen when it comes to supporting the recovery. What role can private business be playing in the economic recovery of Bangladesh? And what are the opportunities for UK investors to help put into our beautiful country? We also want to investigate the role of philanthropy and organisations such as the British Asian Trust. Um, Richard ran you through our contributors, but once again, I'm going to talk you through our panellists, we have Robert Chatterton Dixon, who's the British High Commissioner to Bangladesh and has been so for well over a year now. Um, prior to this appointment, he held various diplomatic posts in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. We're also joined by Saida Muna Tasneem, who is the Bangladeshi High Commissioner to the UK, so a reciprocal there. Um, she's also the first female to hold this position, and she's also ambassador to Ireland and Liberia, so many, many credits there. She was formerly Bangladesh's representative to the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. And High Commissioner Tasneem has also been commended for her contribution to interfaith harmony and philanthropic services. So we'll be asking lots of questions to her in just a moment. Farooq Shaban also joins us. He's the president and CEO of the Bangladesh Enterprise Institute, the BEI, which is an independent research institute for the development of the private sector in Bangladesh. I know lots of you will have burning questions about businesses involvement post-COVID, um, so we can put those to Farooq. As a former diplomat, he served in various capacities in the Bangladesh government and foreign service. Farooq is a member of the Bangladesh Advisory Council for the British Asian Trust, and we're also hoping to be joined by Saida Fiza Kabir, the CEO of Sajida Foundation, a partner of the British Asian Trust. And this organization is fantastic. It works to improve the health outcomes among the most poor and the most vulnerable communities in Bangladesh, which as we all know is such a densely populated country and a small one at that. This is done through diversified social development interventions um, in order to help reach national and international targets for health. Fiza is also the chairperson of the Psychological Health and Wellness Clinic and Managing Director of Home and Community Care and Inner Circle Private. So those are all our panellists and hopefully they can now join me in this Zoom and be unmuted, ready and raring to go to join the discussions. So we're going to kick off by talking about UK and Bangladeshi relations um, and also the current situation in Bangladesh at the moment and the management of the pandemic. So I guess the most relevant two people to kick us off for this would be Saida Munatazneem, the British High Commissioner to the UK, and the British High Commissioner to Bangladesh, Robert Chatterton Dixon. So um, who would like to just summarise the situation in Bangladesh at the moment and how Bangladesh has overall managed the pandemic, um, Saida or Robert? Robert? Well, I can go first, I think. I mean, I think what I would say is that um, the pandemic has been much less of a problem in Bangladesh than it has in many other parts of the world. Uh, the total death toll, which is obviously only one measure, uh, is around 5,000, so much, much lower. And even though there may be some undercounting in that, uh, it is very clear that there has not been a huge sort of excess of mortality in the way that we've seen in some other countries when they've been affected by COVID. Uh, and um, uh, what, what we're now seeing as a result of that is uh, life returning to something like normal. Um, I mean, I think like all governments, the government here found COVID very difficult to deal with. Um, there was what was described as a holiday that was a sort of lockdown uh, during uh, April and May. And Dhaka was extraordinarily quiet at that time. And there was, I think, some very clear sort of signs of social distress among sort of people who normally make their livings day to day. I think life was very difficult for them. Um, people like rickshaw pullers and market traders and, you know, the people who normally make their living in the sort of, you know, in a day -to -day, on a day-to-day -day basis. But 
because the pandemic itself has been much less bad than had been feared, uh, the country has recovered much more quickly. And there is something of a debate going on in the sort of policy community at the moment about economic growth. But it is clear that there will be some growth of sort of two to four percent, which considering that in the, much of the rest of the world, we're seeing very sharp recessions for the year as a whole. I think that's quite an achievement for Bangladesh. So uh, I think uh, it's obviously one should never assume that things can't get more difficult. But at this stage, I think Bangladesh has had what one might describe as a good pandemic. And as a result is seeing a reasonably good economic recovery. So life here feels, I think, more normal and more positive uh, than it does in uh, a lot of other parts of the world. Maybe we can use this as a, a, as a time to sort of capitalise on the fact that things, I'm assuming, are, t are going back to normality, would you say, Saida? Um, thank you. I, I didn't raise my hand. I wanted Richard, uh, Robert to say oh, something about feel it. Feel free to chip in. Robert yeah. gave a very good, uh, you know, roundup about how we are faring with uh, COVID. And I think that one thing I would like to add to what he said is that um, the way we've managed is how our prime minister had planned it. And I think it worked out quite well. Uh, you know, there was a Forbes list of uh, women heads of government and states who are managing their COVID very well. And she was in that list. So it was a list of 14 um, heads of government, including New Zealand and all that. The reason is, you know, um, the economic growth factor and the management factor. There's a lot of money that was put in from the prime minister, 14.3 billion um, US dollars from our GDP, you know, as it was given for the public funds uh, to protect the industry, for, to protect the livelihood, uh, you know, every day, daily wagers, the garment workers, daily wagers, rickshaw pullers, they were provided each of them were provided 2,000 taka. And there was this huge population of more than 10 million people who, who had enjoyed this, you know, who had uh, sort of protected themselves livelihoods during this time. So that is why, you know, there was a big cushion. It was like more than 4% of our GDP. And the growth that has come back, post-COVID growth that uh, Robert said, 3 to 4%, which is, uh, uh, you know, um, IMF economic outlook, world economic outlook also said that it's going to be about 4% growth. So, you know, it, Compared to South Asia, is the highest growth. In fact, in Asia, it could be the second highest growth. So uh, we're not doing that badly. But I think what we've lost in a post-COVID is our bilateral trade with Britain and uh, bilateral trade with many countries. So uh, when you have a lockdown in Britain, there's no one going to the shops to buy anything. So you know, our number one export to, uh, item to Britain is the third largest export destination for Bangladesh, which is ready-made garment. And not only uh, you know we're not being able to recover because there are no sales. There's only online sales. But um, we have also not been able to recover some of the business that haven't been paid, including about 500 million still. The BGME can confirm it, but it's about 500 million. So we still to recover that. So I think economically, we've really suffered in terms of trade. And we absolutely want to make sure that the British investments in Bangladesh stay. And I think, uh, like Robert said, things are pretty, you know, looking not that bad in Bangladesh in terms of COVID. But uh, you know, mostly the sectors are HSBC, Standard Chartered, so financial services are number one, and then we have these uh, you know post-colonial companies which continue their business and doing very well, like British Asian Tobacco and uh, you know James Finlay, the tea companies, etc. Unilever. So I think everyone's doing good. I mean, there's still consumption and the economy is circulating. Uh, so in that way, I think post-COVID, uh, we we have haven't done that bad. Now would be a good time to bring in Farouk Saban, CEO of the British Enterprise Institute. Um, so Farouk, you heard what Saida was just saying about businesses in, in Bangladesh. What role do you feel pri private business could be playing in the economic recovery of uh, Bangladesh? And how do you feel the situation is for businesses in Bangladesh at, at the moment in general? Well, there have been some uh, challenges obviously, but uh, I think the, uh, uh, I would say industry, business, banking is now pretty much uh, back to, to normal in many ways. Uh, I see uh, basically as uh, uh, the High Commissioner, our High Commissioner mentioned, uh, uh, Mona, that uh, one of our problems is uh, that we are uh, very heavily dependent on one export product, uh, namely ready-made garments or apparel, and that uh, quite a few of our uh, traditional markets uh, have been badly hit by the, the pandemic. So you had this reference to our exports uh, to Britain. 
So one of the things which uh, we really need to uh, focus on is diversifying our exports and diversifying our markets. Now, one very interesting product, uh, which is making inroads, for example, into the British market, uh, would be a pharmaceutical product. So uh, I don't know uh, if your listeners or, or would be aware of this, but uh, we now have uh, probably two dozen of our uh, uh, pharmaceutical products manufactured in uh, Bangladesh that are currently uh, on sale in, in Britain uh, in pharmacies and, and through the National Health Service. Uh, we expect this to be a major sector of growth uh, in the years ahead. Uh, and I was, in fact, a short while ago talking to the managing director of uh, one of our four leading pharmaceutical companies. And he was mentioning that he has uh, six of his products currently on sale. But he hopes that in the next two years, uh, the six will become 60. Uh, so we see uh, the pharmaceutical sector as a major sector uh, making uh, headway in the British market. Uh, I think uh, three other areas where I, I would like to focus on, and here again, uh, we seem to be doing quite well in the British market, is uh, uh, the IT and software sector. Uh, we are... Um, uh, Britain has now emerged as uh, our second uh, biggest market uh, in the area of software development. And uh, we see this as expanding substantially. Where, um, while our uh, major industries, uh, the large companies, uh, have bounced back, our small and medium enterprises uh, are still facing problems. While the government has uh, rolled out some uh, uh, packages for them through the banking sector, uh, these still have to uh, get off the ground and, and make uh, a headway. So that remains a, a challenge. The other area where, in fact, we've been in, in uh, extended conversation with uh, Richard and the, the trust in, in uh, London is uh, on the issue of skills development. So um, as you know, Bangladesh has uh, a fairly large uh, number of people working overseas. Uh, I'd say the figure would be close to 10 million. Uh, and that excludes, let's say, a country like Britain, where uh, they're not temporary workers, but people who've settled there permanently. And as we know, a large number of them are in the, uh, the restaurant business, which has taken a big hit. Uh, I was just talking to one of our, my friends, a restaurant owner, uh, uh, Aziz, uh, well known to the High Commissioner. And uh, one area where he feels that uh, we, they would need some help and support is um, in uh, getting uh, an adequate uh, supply of uh, chefs uh, uh, coming in from Bangladesh. So one of the things we need to be doing is really uh, focusing on skills development, uh, particularly in the health sector. We see that as, as a big demand both for Bangladesh, but an even bigger demand uh, for uh, Europe, uh, for Japan, uh, and for uh, many other countries. I'll stop you. Well, that, that's an interesting point you touched upon. So small and medium businesses are suffering more. And also, could other countries perhaps be using these, utilizing these skills? Robert, I know that some years ago, there's a big controversy about the fact that there aren't enough Bangladeshi chefs to cater for the needs of the UK. We're coming into a situation where Brexit is going through is there a way that Britain can help in some way with mopping up the skills and also helping small to medium enterprise in some way? Because we're going to lose a lot of the uh, links with European companies we're currently dealing with. Uh, 
Yes. Well, what's going to happen, of course, is that people are going to be people will people from Europe will lose the automatic right to come and live and work in the UK. Um, and the idea is that we can recruit the best people uh, with the skills that we need from wherever they are in the world. And I would very much welcome it if they are from um, Bangladesh. And clearly, Bangladesh has a lot of very well educated people with skills that we need in the UK. And I've no doubt that uh, there will be lots of opportunities for people in Bangladesh who are working in areas where we have shortages. Uh, to go and um, to go and contribute in the UK, uh, and we are looking forward to welcoming them. Um, what I think is worth saying, I mean, there is a particular issue around skills, um, and there's a particular issue around health skills because we are we have been supporting the uh, development of nursing and midwifery as professions in Bangladesh, and I think it's important that we don't immediately find that the skills that we've developed in Bangladesh for uh, the benefit of healthcare in Bangladesh, we, those people aren't immediately. Uh, absorbed by um, the health system in the UK. So we need to be sure we get that balance right. But there will undoubtedly be opportunities that people will be able to, um, to make the best of. There is a particular issue around chefs. One of the things, of course, that people who are going to the UK will need to do is to be paid. Um, you know, there will be a, a minimum salary below which people can't be recruited. And there has been a particular issue with curry chefs because on the whole, they are not a very well paid group of people. And I think the point is to move them up the skills level so that the restaurant owners are able to pay them enough for them to qualify uh, to meet the salary requirements for, for, for moving to the UK. So it's a, it's a slightly complicated specific sector, but I've no doubt that in terms of sort of wider um, skills opportunities, there's going to be a lot of opportunity for people in Bangladesh to move and contribute in the UK uh, in the years ahead. Thank you. I see that Zaida Fiza Kabir has joined us. Um, Zaida is the CEO of Sajida Foundation, uh, working to help improve outcomes of the most poor and vulnerable communities in Bangladesh. We were talking just before you joined uh, about the fact that normality is returning somewhat, especially for sort of rickshaw workers and people working on the, on the street. How do you feel the COVID-19 situation has affected those sort of at the bottom of the pecking order in, in Bangladesh? Um, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting uh, Sajida Foundation and my apologies. Uh, we are going through a rough patch. Um, as you know, Dr. Ashik Selim was supposed to join here and he's unwell and, and I'm going through uh, some rough patches personally as well. So it's kind of a uh, tough time for the organization. Please and, do as well. Send our best wishes to the doctor. Yes, yes. He, he, he is hopefully on the way to recovery. So, but he would need, you know, probably, uh, you know, the two weeks. This, this is another thing about COVID. I, we're hearing yes. more and more of long term repercussions. So yes. people combat yes. it, but then it's ongoing. Um, yeah. On Going and, and also as an organization, like I would like to start with that to your question that, that you know, uh, yes, things are getting back to normal. Uh, that's very true. And that actually puts us into more kind of vulnerable situation um, as well, because, you know, th things like this has become the new normal that I commit uh, to something um, or, you know, we, but all on a sudden, you know, you come up with a crisis, whether, whether it's in, it, it, personally or as an organization, and it is so unpredictable. And the intensity of the crisis, it varies, uh, in, it comes into patches. Uh, so, so it is very unpredictable. So given that situation, you know, it is, it is a tough call. And of course, at the, um, to, to kind of reach uh, where we want to reach and how do we un and want to address the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, so for example, Sajida has been um, long involved with pavement dwellers and underdeveloped slums and squatters. Uh, so the biggest challenge I would say right now is, is, is how do we reach them? How do we you know, provide the services that we used to provide them? For example, we had pavement dweller centers, but since March till today, I would say that we 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 are we have not been able to offer or op reopen services for them. You know, we we are operating probably maximum at twenty percent capacity because how do we start the 
you know, reopen the daycare services. You know, they, they used to have bathing services, cooking services, resting, resting facilities, then, you know, livelihood and skills uh, training, those things. So what we are trying to do is that they have lost their jobs, you know, lost their um, businesses. Uh, so what the, our primary focus uh, 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 is now providing them cash transfers, so making cash transfers. So there, then there is a huge challenge with that as we say that we, we have digitalized um, ourselves and you know the mobile banking is working well. But if you work at the bottom of the pyramid, it is not. There is a lot of issues and challenges still we need to kind of figure out. Um, uh, so, so the main aspect is that how do we, you know, the ensuring that we provide, you know, they have cash flows or they have food or, or, and hygiene, you know, uh, materials, uh, you know, accessible. So that is kind of our main focus right now on this, on the, on the other side, we are looking into avenues where alternative skills, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, programs can can be developed. So, so we are engaging in research initiatives along those lines. I would say. So, so. Yeah. Now, uh, Saeed Amuna, I know that you're only with us for another fifteen minutes, but we've heard what Zaida was saying. Being there in Bangladesh and, and seeing this, is there anything that the that we can be doing in the UK or doing in conjunction with the UK for the? two situations the countries are currently in at the moment because we're both kind of in a unique position I think all countries aren't now and we have to make the best of what situation we're in to sort of all work together what, what can be done I think that you know uh, the post-covid recovery um, our prime minister wrote an article at the financial times uh, I think about 10 days back it's about how the post-covid recovery should be it should be greener it should be more resilient so in, in terms of greener and resilient, I was just, you know, started the foundation. Uh, she was mentioning that, you know, about the urbanization and the slum dwellers, how to reach them. Uh, so if we want to make it greener, we definitely have to work around those areas uh, where it has to be greener cities, more sustainable. <clears throat> and uh, in terms of resilience, also that area. So coming back to that, I think, uh, you know, in post-COVID, uh, in, a, in a kind of a parallel between UK and Bangladesh, um, uh, some, somehow, you know, Bangladesh's infection rates are lower than the UK, but Bangladesh is, you know, we had achieved so much in SDGs in reducing poverty. And because of COVID, some millions of people may slide back into poverty, just like she mentioned, especially, you know, urban poverty, because, you know, most of the people uh, are currently are, uh, I mean, you know, 65 or 70 percent people are city based right now. Uh, it's a global phenomenon. So I think the global phenomenon wise, every city is suffering from that. Even London may have poverty in uh, certain pockets or certain ethnicities. So I think there's the similarity, but I just want to give you this good news that you know, in our bilateral relations, there are certain pillars. One is like economy, political relationship, geopolitical relationship, where the Rohingya thing fits in. But there is a very important part in our relationship with our diaspora. And you know, I'm very pleased to inform you that, and particularly Richard would be very happy to know um, in from the perspective of British Asian Trust that promotes the diaspora to get involved in. So here from here, we had, you know, this Mr. Dabirul Islam Chaudhry. I don't know if you heard about it. He's a centenarian and he, he was following Captain Moore's um, uh, you know, example. And he was walking at the age of 100 and he has raised 420,000 pounds during Ramadan, walking in Ramadan. And he is uh, out of that, uh, 120,000 has been given to the NHS by British Bangladeshi community. And I think Connie should be something to be very proud of. And the uh, rest of the money were given in charities in UK and also in Bangladesh. So I think our diaspora is extremely valuable in raising funds uh, when it comes to curry industry and the problem that uh, Robert had mentioned that you know about chefs. It's a pre-COVID problem. Uh, it's about point-based system. If you have to take a chef, you have to pay them 30K, which is quite irrational. So uh, for that, you know, uh, in post-COVID, we do have to work towards saving the curry industry. It's very important. Uh, for that, you know, uh, Mr. Aziz, uh, Ambassador Farooq Subhan, my former foreign secretary mentioned, he is trying to set up this uh, training, you know, chef training institute, a, a degree that would be recognized by UK in the point-based system. In terms of nurses that uh, Robert had mentioned, 
I'm really trying to promote uh, more caregiver and uh, nurses to be recruited by UK from Bangladesh. It's extremely important. One area that we haven't explored, and just wanted to uh, assure Robert that you know we have plenty to train in Bangladesh. We should bring some to the UK. Uh, you, we have to enter that market where our nurses can work as caregivers. And last, you know, I would like to, I don't know if, if I have time to come back again, but this is for Richard. Uh, you know, British Asian Trust is doing such a wonderful job, you know, in, in small amount of time. I and mean, you just entered uh, Bangladesh in last November, I think. And within this small, uh, you know, period, a window of time, you've really done well for one year. One area is that uh, I would, uh, in, uh, you know, following the footsteps of His Royal Highness, who promotes circular economy and nature-based solutions, I would really ask British Asian Trust to work in biodiversity in Bangladesh, particularly in Cox's Bazaar, you know, in, in uh, where the Rohingya, uh, and they're not refugees, by the way, uh, they're forcibly displaced persons. And, you know, the entire uh, three, the camps, the 1.1 million people, they're in Teknaf, they're in Inani, there are three protected areas, it used to be. All the uh, trees have been felled there. All the forestry is gone. Now, but the most important thing is there was a trail of, you see, there are 270 elephants in Bangladesh. An elephant is a, it's called a red stone, especially critically endangered uh, species. And 40 of those 270 are in that area. And they are seriously critically, they might die, 40 of them. And I know that British Asian Trust works in preserving, uh, you know, uh, conserving biodiversity. I would really request you that, while you work with their uh, uh, Rohingya uh, you know, children, why don't you also work on uh, biodiversity in Cox's Bazaar in saving the forests, for example, in Sundarbans. Under the Queen's Canopy Commonwealth, we have um, uh, the Salbans near Bangladesh, but we really want to include more Sal forests for biodiversity. So that is one area that I would request British Asian Trust to uh, include in a green recovery because biodiversity is extremely important. Well, green issues are very close to uh, Prince Charles's heart and the royal family getting more and more involved in, in this. Richard, what, what can we do? It, 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 it's a very good prompt and I, uh, I'm sure, uh, as you say, the royal family definitely very involved in this and this is something that's very, very close to the prince's heart. We, as, as the British Asian Trust, we actually merged at the start of this year with another royal conservation charity called Elephant Family. Um, and so now conservation issues and biodiversity is one of our sort of five top priority thematic areas. Um, and we're, we're now in the process of having these discussions with colleagues in Bangladesh about what are the areas that we should be really focusing on. And I think, Muna, what you've just said about us, you, you, you know, considering biodiversity as one of our strands as we move forward, um, I hear everything you're saying and we'll definitely take that forward. Um, there's definitely a big area for us to, to, to pick up the work that we're doing in skilling, as, as Farouk has said, and I think, as everybody has said, I think we need to get that right. But uh, working with young people, uh, I know the government does tremendous work there. I know uh, that, that through the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and Robert and his team, I know that y young people in skilling is also a big priority there. And I think there's, there's a huge role there for us. Uh, and I know that that's something that's also... Uh, extremely important to the to the prince and so I think potentially those are two areas another area that I think um, that we would want to be looking at at some point is mental health um, and so we've we've done uh, some we've supported some tremendous work of the Sajida Foundation this year on mental health um, we have a major mental health program in the region and, and I think that we're all aware that the the impact of of COVID uh, is having an even stronger impact on people's mental health and it's certainly raised awareness of a lot of issues whether it's the, the impact of the health issues the impact of the the, the economic crisis um, there are a lot of people now uh, with with clear mental health issues um, and certainly across the region that 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 we need to be picking up so I think there's those are the three areas that I think that we need to be looking at in the future and working with colleagues on the ground to really see what we can do um, at scale about those. Okay, I think Robert wanted to chip something in and, and then Robert will go back to Saida before she has to leave the call. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. If I could just make sort of three suggestions for sort of things that we can do. The first is that obviously the long-term solution to COVID is a vaccine. And we made a commitment at the UN General Assembly, Dominic Raab, our foreign secretary, made a commitment at the UN General Assembly that there should be equitable access to vaccines across the world. 
and we're making a practical contribution to that in Bangladesh through uh, making sure that there's a proper scientific basis for the cold chain throughout Bangladesh. So in other words, the ability to distribute vaccines uh, once they're developed within Bangladesh. You need a cold chain, you know, fridges and, and cold storage to make sure everyone has access to it. And we're contributing to that, which is a very direct contribution, we hope, in the medium term to a proper resolution of the problem. The second thing is trade, where, as we already mentioned, we, know we are a key trading partner. And one of the things that's encouraging is the way in which a lot of those trading relationships, having had a very difficult time early in the pandemic, have now started to bounce back. So some of the big British companies who buy in Bangladesh, like Primark, like Marks and Spencers, are now virtually back up to uh, full capacity in the contracts that they're placing with Bangladeshi buyers. So that, um, that sort of private sector uh, contribution to the recovery is, is well advanced and is going to be really important. And the third thing is, I think we've been touching on a really important part of the relationship, which is around climate and biodiversity. Because, uh, as you will know, we are the chairs of the COP26 climate conference next year. Bangladesh and the Honourable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina is chair of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, which brings together climate vulnerable countries. And nature-based solutions is a really important part of the overall way in which we're going to be addressing the problem of climate. Uh, and I think I, I hear what Muna says about Cox's Bazaar. I was actually in the camps a few weeks ago, and it is remarkable how in, in a planting programme has really started to deliver results there. The camps and the areas around them already look much less devastated than they did, although clearly uh, there's a long-term problem there. But the other thing I'd mention is the Sundarbans, which I think are absolutely crucial. Uh, Typhoon Amphan would have done much more damage in May had it not been for the existence of a natural mm -hmm. mangrove forest, which absorbed um, the tidal surges. And I think if one's looking for a good example globally of how nature-based solutions can play a critical part in adaptation to climate change, then the Sundarbans is a, is a fantastic one. Uh, and I think it's making sure that that sort of nature-based um, asset remains intact is going to be a key part of the programming work that we're going to be doing in support of our climate objectives here. And I'm quite certain that it's something that would also appeal to the Prince, who clearly has been a passionate prophet of all of these things for many years. Absolutely. Saida, before you leave us. Yes, um, I was just, go I'm going to pick the tab up from uh, Robert, you know, in terms of uh, climate change. Yes, we have assumed the presidency of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, uh, but at the end of the day, um, to worry, um, uh, you know, um, Britain and the UK, uh, UK and Bangladesh would be celebrating 50 years of our relationship next year. And one of the key things that I've proposed from my side should be climate. So the, I, we wanted it to be based on three areas. One is history and heritage, because we have a history and heritage. And you know, Commonwealth is part of it. Our relationship with royal family is part of it. And uh, in that context, we were really hoping that His Royal Highness would be visiting Bangladesh. We really planned it from a long time. And he's asked me on many occasions, when, when am I going to, he, he was getting pretty impatient to go to Bangladesh. And then we said, well, you can't go in 2020 and 2021, but I really, really hope that he'll be able to make it. So, you know, preserving history and heritage, which in Bangladesh UK is going to be a project uh, and something that VAT could look into because His Royal Highness is really interested in preserving heritage. We do have quite a few heritage institutions uh, from UK British period in Bangladesh, including Dhaka University, which is going to be celebrating its centenary next year. And Dhaka University was established by, uh, you know, Viceroy during that time. And uh, the London, uh, University of London Register was the first um, uh, vice chancellor. So we had quite a few English vice chancellor there. So these kind of history and heritage and the other theme is climate change. And we hope that we'll be able to kick off the uh, year of 50th anniversary with a climate change program. And uh, uh, again, I would come back to you know uh, nature-based solutions. Um, that means we have some adaptation and resilience programs that is uh, the prime minister is going to promote because we had just hosted the Global Center for Adaptation, and uh, in that you know our floating vegetable, which is a nature-based solution, is something that I really want to sell. Uh, you know, as as a wonderful project of, of uh, adaptation. I mean, you can float and you can still make rice and everything that you want to. And it's a green uh, floating vegetable. And the other one is, you know, salinity resistant crops that makes us a uh, you know, self-sufficient uh, nation in food uh, production. So uh, this kind of project that I think British Asian Trust can look into. Uh, I have a suggestion for Richard, uh, which is that, you know, there's an organization called IUCN. It's, con it's, a, it's a conservation of nature. And IUCN is working in Cox's Bazaar as well as in every single uh, for, uh, you know, um, they've got a program called Mangrove for the Future, 
So um, Robert has mentioned about Sundarbans and preserving it, I've mentioned it, but we can have actually mangrove throughout the coastal area and they work in this project and you could work with IUCN for con conservation. It's just a perfect organization to promote what His Royal Highness's passion is to pre preserve the biodiversity and the environment and have a circular economy. So um, I would really, you know, in looking for a partner, you should work it, you could consider IUCN. And one last thing from, from, from my side is that, uh, you know, in, in the uh, uh, vaccine and research and development, I think one area between Bangladesh and UK and post COVID should be research and development in the public health sector uh, and other sectors. Um, you know, uh, Ambassador Park Suman said that we are now trying to diversify our um, trade and enter the British market in pharmaceuticals, PPE, and all that. But also, we are in dialogue with the Imperial College. They are coming up with Imperial College, um, you know, vaccine. And Robert just mentioned that they're, you know, UK is trying to support the um, uh, sub-zero, you know, the cold storage all over the country because, you know, the vaccine has to be kept in under minus minus 72, minus 72 degrees, which is really, really low. So we are in dialogue with Imperial College, and we really hope that, you know, uh, in the Oxford vaccine, it uh, it went to the India Serum Institute, but with Imperial. Uh, there should be a Bangladeshi pharmaceutical company that should be able to manufacture that vaccine. So we're in a dialogue with them. Uh, that's where I'm focusing on. I hope it'll be successful. And I you know, really wish all the best of luck to British Asian Trust. They're doing such a wonderful job. And His Royal Highness is someone that we really, really love. We want him to go to Bangladesh, preserve our heritage and history, and also work in biodiversity. Thank you. And much. it's really wonderful to be with you. I have to go now. We have a program in the High Commission. It was just Thank wonderful you. being here. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you very much, Muna. Thank you. you. Absolutely. Well said. Thank you there to Saida Muna Tazneem. So we touched upon it earlier. Um, I wanted to just talk about the, the Rohingya situation um, a little bit more. It's often seen as a Bangladesh problem. And, you know, Bangladesh is sort of over there and responsible for it. But really this isn't the case we should be sort of doing more to help um what can be done to sort of help this situation now post covid um robert and side well side is because you have to go um you can quickly say yeah sorry robert would you give me the opportunity I, I, because you know she said rohingya and i had to come back <laughs> okay my program today is on rohingya yes you're absolutely right you know today my opening remarks will be you know all these years, Bangladesh has always been branded with poverty, natural disasters, calamity, you know, a poor country, in fact, the poor man of South Asia. Uh, of course, we've very much overcome that. We have the highest growth rate in South Asia right now, so nobody can brand us like that. But you know what is our new branding now? We are the Rohingya country. That's a great branding for us. And Rohingyas do not belong to Bangladesh. They're from Myanmar. Myanmar has kicked them out of their country because, you know, they're Muslims, their ethnicity, they don't like them. They're just xenophobia. And you know, they've landed in Bangladesh and now we have a branding, we're the Rohingya country. But Rohingyas have to go back because preserving, you know, you know, uh, day after tomorrow, there'll be a huge conference, pledging conference where US, UK will be pledging, you know, just for this year, we will need 1 billion US dollars for Rohingyas. And 50% of it has been uh, realized and 50%, you know, the US Secretary of State and the British Secretary, they'll be pledging more money into it. Now my question is, how long can you sustain it like that? Keeping the Rohingyas here in, in, in the, this kind of a lifestyle in, in camps, is that good for them? Or going back to their own country with full citizenship, with rights, you know, legal rights is good for them. More importantly, you know, Myanmar has committed some war crimes, you know, the, the genocide at the International Court of Justice, there's a case, and that's what we are discussing here at the High Commission today. The case says, you know, the, the ICJ has given some provisional uh, uh, hearing, uh, uh, you know, measures, and in the measure, it says that genocide has been committed against this particular ethnicity by the state, and the state has to protect them. They have to ensure that nobody gets harmed. So under these circumstances, we have to international community, UK, who's the Security Council pen holder on, on Rohingya, really have to uh, intensify their efforts to engage with Myanmar and take their people back because this cannot be a life for the Rohingya people and they're the most persecuted people. Now, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has been extremely generous out of compassion she has given shelter to them because in 1971, if you recall, 10 million Bengalis went to India and we stayed there for nine months and then we all came back because we had a country to come back to and we knew who we are. But the Rohingyas, they're saying they're the Rohingyas. Uh, the Burmese people are saying they're Bengalis. They're not Bengalis. So, you know, here's the attempt to completely do an ethnic cleansing, a deletion of one particular ethnic minority. So coming back 
UK is actually doing maximum, I would say, among all the countries uh, in terms of uh, you know supporting the humanitarian assistance. But I think for Bangladesh, right now, humanitarian assistance is not our target. Our target is to get justice for the Rohingyas so that they can go back. If we don't get them rights, liberties, freedoms, and a legal status in Myanmar, they are not willing to go back. They've told us they need these things. And UK can help in engaging with you, uh, you know, uh, with, with Myanmar, uh, along with the other members of the Security Council. We're also encouraging China to get in the process because they have a huge influence in Myanmar. Uh, and the Security Council is divided right now. So that way, UK is really, really, uh, you know, uh, supporting us. The uh, British Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab, he just gave a statement uh, day for yesterday, 15th of October, where he made it very clear that to UK, uh, accountability is important. Those people, uh, uh, should be held accountable, uh, whoever is the perpetrator of genocide in, in Myanmar. And uh, UK has also put sanctions on certain people. So that way, I really want to thank the UK government for all the role they're playing, the diplomatic role they're playing, and also the humanitarian role they're playing. But yes, as far as the Rohingyas are concerned, Myanmar have to take them back. They cannot get away with murder. They cannot get away with genocide, ethnic cleansing, and yet nobody can say anything to them. That's pretty strange. Uh, thank you, that'll be my comment. Sorry, I just took the floor. No, no, no problem at all. Um, um, yeah, I know that Robert had something to say on that, but I, I, I want to bring Farouk back into the discussion. Um, so we're going to park that, unless you can be really quick, Robert. Uh, just, I think Muna said it all. It's, but what we need is for the Rohingyas to be able to return safely, voluntarily, and in a dignified manner to uh, Myanmar. We're working very hard to support that. In the meantime, we're working very hard to support the Rohingyas while they're in Cox's yeah. Bazaar, but we don't want them to stay there any longer than they have to. It, when I was in Cox's Bazaar a few weeks ago, the Rohingyas are clear they want to go back, but they are very grateful to Bangladesh for looking after them in the meantime, and we're supporting both sides of that. Definitely. I mean, who doesn't want to go back to their homeland, but it has to be, yeah, the right situation there and their treatment has to be right. Um, Farouk. So we, let's talk a bit more about business in Bangladesh at the moment. We're at a crucial, crucial stage. We heard before as well that, um, you know, uh, the small to medium businesses are the ones that are really, really suffering here post COVID. Um, you know, lots of the big garment factories have got their contracts being reinstated. Um, how can the British Asian Trust be helping right now? Uh... <clears throat> Well, I'd just very briefly like to go back to the issue of the Rohingyas. I mean, oh, yeah. okay. uh, during yeah. my career as a, as a diplomat, uh, I dealt with this on uh, a number of occasions. And we were <coughs> successful uh, both in 1978, uh, when we had 300,000 Rohingyas come across. Uh, and then again in 91, 92, when we had a further 300,000 <clears> come across, uh, that we were able to send them back. Uh, somehow on this particular occasion, uh, it would appear that Myanmar uh, have not only dug their heels in, but they seem to be determined to throw out uh, the remaining uh, half a million or so Rohingyas that are still living in the Rakhine. Uh, and I think this, uh, in a sense, poses a challenge, not simply for Bangladesh, but for the international com community in particular, uh, for the United Nations. Are we going to allow Myanmar to get away with this? Uh, and I think this deserves much more attention uh, than it has received uh, because reportedly the conditions uh, in the Rakhine uh, are for the Rohingyas uh, have gone from bad to worse. So. Uh, as regards your point, uh, I, I thought I, I should also flag, uh, since we're talking about UK-Bangladesh uh, relations, uh, here we have uh, the UK now sort of in the final, uh, as it were, throes of uh, uh, negotiating Brexit. Uh, whereas in the case of Bangladesh, uh, the big issue on the uh, agenda is that in 2024, Bangladesh will be 
graduating from its present status as a least developed country, uh, which means that we're going to lose a number of the benefits that we enjoy in terms of duty-free access uh, into Europe and, and in, at the moment into the United Kingdom. Yeah. So I think one very big issue which we will have to deal with in the coming months is our trade relationship with the United Kingdom. And, uh, and I think that would require a, a certainly a great deal of work. Uh, and uh, a second point, which I think is going to be of critical importance for Bangladesh uh, in the coming uh, post COVID years, uh, especially if we look at uh, the eighth five-year plan of Bangladesh, which has just been announced, uh, is the importance of foreign direct investment. And how do we attract uh, uh, something in the nature of $200 billion over the next 10 years of foreign direct investment? And reaching out to countries like the United Kingdom, I think, uh, will be a big issue. And uh, my own experience, because after I, I stepped down as Foreign Secretary, Sheikh Hasina, who was then Prime Minister, appointed me as Chairman of the Board of Investment. And so I spent, uh, did several trips to the UK in terms of trying to attract foreign investment, including reaching out to the large Bangladeshi diaspora there. So I think that's going to be another big uh, issue in the in the bilateral relationship. And the third issue which I wanted to mention was, uh, which Muna did refer to, was heritage. Uh, now, I myself went to university, uh, I was at, up at Oxford, and uh, we have, uh, uh, at last count, there are 22 members of our family, uh, going back, of course, uh, three generations who went to university in England, to Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, if we now uh, look at this, the situation, both my son and daughter went to university uh, in America. I was able to persuade my son to come back and do his master's at SOAS. Uh, but these links, which were such a strong part of, uh, let's say, our links with Britain, seem to be now fading away. What can we do now that uh, Britain is, is, as it were, uh, reinventing itself? Uh, can it reinvent also its relations uh, with Bangladesh, uh, looking at reestablishing the old links we had uh, in terms of education? Okay. I'll just finish off by saying a, a brief word about uh, uh, skills development. This, this is a challenge. Uh, I sit on um, several boards, uh, including the board of one of our largest banks. I also chair the board of the Bangladesh Center for Corporate Social Responsibility. Uh, we've been doing our best to, to help uh, uh, small and medium enterprises and a large number of our NGOs, if you take BRAC or if you take Grameen Bank and, and uh, including the Sajida Foundation, they do work with uh, small and, 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 and medium enterprises and especially in terms of uh, uh, access to credit. The big issue is access to finance and, uh, and that's, that's a challenge which we are facing more so than ever before because of the pandemic because a lot of it has yeah. to do with physical contact. <clears throat> Although we're trying to digitalize uh, to the maximum extent possible, and that is uh, a big priority for the government. But that okay. is- Well, I've time. got to just cut in there because we're, we're nearly running out of time. Um, so Richard, quite a lot for you to digest there, but just quickly, Saeed, would you like to add anything before I hand over to Richard to uh, wrap up and have the last word on all these issues that have now been put to you. Saida. Yeah, uh, so so I'll just um, highlight, you know, a few points on mental health. Um, I think uh, since, you know, the uh, British Asian Trust in during this pandemic, um, you know, we were doing, uh, we were able to do some wonderful work 
but overall as we um, I, I would like to make a point that that since you know livelihood and skills is a major issue but now I think uh, the sector of healthcare um, has been greatly uh, neglected in terms of life you know skills development so I think uh, British Asian trust um, and play a key role there um, uh, in terms of uh, helping us structure, um, uh, structure, you know, certified um, courses of international uh, standard, uh, which is recognized internationally, and and you know, short, short to you know, medium term uh, courses, and and thereby, you know, taking in, on young people from rural and urban areas, and 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 helping us, uh, you know. Um, set up uh, institutes of that nature. Sajita Foundation is committed to do, doing so in, in setting up, um, you know, institute uh, which caters to, uh, to develop healthcare professionals uh, which, where we have a market in Bangladesh and, and internationally as well. I think there is a key area where where uh, where definitely you know a partnership could flourish. Um, that that's all you know. I very think good. for now, and then, then we can take it forward. Thank yeah. you very yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you, Ro Robert. I'll cut my concluding words in half because I could see that you wanted to say something very very quickly. Um, I was just going to pick up on a couple of points uh, Baruch made about education and and uh, what we can offer in the financial area. But I think I'll end. I mean. What I'd really like to say is this has been a fantastic discussion. I think we've only been able to just scratch the surface. I'm really grateful for the BAT for coming to Bangladesh. I think as High Commissioner here, this is one of the most exciting things, you know, one of the most exciting tools that I have in my toolbox of things to take forward, this really uh, exciting relationship between our two countries. There's so much to work on. There's Commonwealth, there's climate, there's education, uh, there's the people to people links. And next year is going to be very exciting because it's the 50th anniversary of Bangladesh. We've been with Bangladesh right from the start. And it's, uh, it's great to have the BAT working alongside us to really make the most of this relationship. So thank you to you, Connie, everybody who's made this event such a, such a, such a great start to, uh, to really exploring that potential. Well, that, Robert, thank you very, very much. I won't repeat what you've just said, but uh, the sentiments that you said are exactly the ones that I would have would have concluded with. So uh, unfortunately, time means we, d we do need to to stop. As, as Robert said, I think we've only scratched the surface. I've I've learned a huge amount. And thank you all for giving me about 15 tasks to take away and and look <laughs> into. Um, Connie, thank you very much indeed for, for, for finding the time to uh, coordinate today. It's great to have you as an ambassador and really appreciate your time today. Uh, to, to all of our panel, Farouk, I, I'm very fortunate to work on a regular basis with um, as a member of our, our advisory council. Uh, and his guidance and, and wisdom is always absolutely tremendous. Uh, Fizzer, we've not had the chance to meet in person yet, but uh, I hope that the work we've our organisations have done together this year is the start of a, a long and fruitful relationship. Uh, and then clearly, I'm, I'm extremely grateful for the fact that we've had uh, two two high commissioners with us. Uh, Muna has, has has left already, but she's a very good friend of the British Asian Trust and uh, and really helps with the work that we do with the diaspora here in the UK. Uh, and Robert, um, it's been absolutely tremendous. I really appreciate you finding the time to join us. Um, your support. Uh, from the launch event a year ago and in other areas over the last year has been absolutely tremendous. And for us as an organisation, really trying to achieve impact um, in the future in Bangladesh, that relationship with you and your colleagues, uh, with whom we're very fortunate to enjoy a very strong relationship, is absolutely tremendous. So thank you very, very much indeed. Um, I'd also like to, to thank everybody. Um, oh, sorry, I've got an eyelash caught in my eye. Um, sorry, <laughs> very sorry. I'd also like to just thank um, all of the people that have participated today. I've been able to see there's a, a lot of you in, in Bangladesh and South Asia and a number of colleagues uh, in the UK as well. Thank you very much for finding the time. I hope that's been useful. If you want to follow anything up, please do contact me or my colleagues. As I said, we will send around a recording um, of this session uh, and we can also send that out to, to people who weren't able to join us. But if there's anything at all that you want to pick up and uh, take forward with us, please do. 
Uh, and the final thing I'd say is just do look out for the other sessions that we have coming up in the, the BAT Insights series. So with that, I'll say thank you all very much indeed once again to Connie, to our panellists and to all of you for joining us. Thank you ever so much.